Hi, my name is Amanda McWhart. I'm a horticulture production extension specialist with the University of Arkansas Cooperative Extension Service. Today I'm going to talk about managing spring fertility and choosing a trellising system for commercial blackberry production. Now in each class I'm always going to review some basics of blackberry biology and life cycle for the different seasons that we're talking about and today we're talking about the spring. So in the spring we have moved from plant dormancy into when the plants start to break bud and we start to see the floral structures developing. Uh, again during this time period temperature is going to be a really important consideration. And again, here in the southeast, we have some issues with fluctuating temperatures in the spring, uh, where we'll have a really warm spell followed by a very cool spell. And very often that results in the plants breaking dormancy early and beginning to flower. And when we have those cold spells, if the temperatures do drop below that 27 degrees Fahrenheit, we will start to see uh, damage to the floral structures. Uh, and again, that will result in what we call black eyes or the black center, meaning that that flower was killed. Here are some pictures of what that looks like. Uh, you can see it in an open blossom on the left hand side and then you can also see it where the flower looked okay from the outside but when we cut the flower open you can actually see that the middle of the flower is actually damaged. You can see that black part of the center. So in both of these cases uh, we're not going to get berries out of these flowers. Again this issue is really important for why we try and match uh, the number of chilling hours that a different region gets with what varieties um, that are planted in that area. So if you get typically four to five hundred hours, we're going to recommend that you try and find varieties that are close to that four to five hundred hour range so that they don't get their chilling hours too early on in the season and then we have these fluctuating temperatures that result in the plant coming out of dormancy well before the winter is actually over. For floral structures that are not damaged by cold, we do expect to see a ripe fruit in 35 to 45 days after flowering. So what are some of the tasks that we have on our spring to-do list? One of them is going to be starting fertilization once the plants start to break dormancy and start growing. We're going to want to monitor emerging primocanes, begin monitoring for insect pests and weed growth, install new plantings, and prepare coolers, packaging, and marketing signs. Fertility management in the spring is an important aspect of blackberry production because we start to see a lot of growth. So again, we're having those emerging primocanes that start to come out and then the plants are starting to flower and those flowers will later, later develop into fruit. So let's talk about fertility management. Getting the fertility right at planting is going to be an important consideration to establishing a successful blackberry planting. Our general recommendation is that you're going to try and apply somewhere between 25 and 50 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre during that first year. Generally, we do not recommend applying any pre-plant nitrogen and instead breaking up that 25 to 50 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre into multiple applications during that first year. The first application could be made somewhere between 30 to 60 days after planting and then continuing to make applications every four to six weeks until late July. One factor that may determine how many applications you make is your soil type. It's important to remember that sandy type soils do not hold nutrients well and water moves through them very quickly and can leach away any fertility that you apply. Clay type soils typically have a higher nutrient holding capacity or CEC. So on a sandy soil you may actually want to divide that total amount that you're wanting to put out into many small applications Whereas on a clay soil, you may be able to get away with putting out a smaller number of higher dose applications. Just for an example, a typical fertility program during that first year may be applying 12 to 15 pounds of actual nitrogen once in May. So that would be your first application after planting, again in ju June, and then a final application in July. Your soil test will make some recommendations to you about how much phosphorus and potassium you need to put out prior to planting. But some general recommendations are 40 to 60 pounds of phosphorus per acre and anywhere from 200 to 400 pounds of potassium. Crop nutrient needs in established plantings are somewhere between 60 and 80 pounds of actual nitrogen per year. So blackberries are not a high nitrogen need crop. If you compare them to something like strawberries that need 120 pounds of nitrogen per year, on a yearly basis or every few years you will want to uh, evaluate soil tests um, to decide if you need to amend with phosphorus or potassium accordingly. Those applications can be made in early spring or in fall. 
I'll also talk about plant tissue nutrient sampling in a later class, and that is a method for growers to monitor the nutrient status of their crop on a yearly basis and amend their fertility program for the following year. Now, if we're going to be applying 60 to 80 pounds of actual nitrogen, how are we going to get that amount to the crop? There's really two different ways that growers apply those nutrients. One is through banded fertilizer applications, and the other is through fertigation. And I'm going to talk about those two different methods here separately. In banded fertilizer applications, uh, generally, again, we're recommending that that total amount of nitrogen be split into multiple applications in the year. In banded fertilizer applications, you're going to want to band the fertilizer uh, down the side of the row. And now in doing this, you want to make sure that the fertilizer does not make contact with the crown of the plants because that may result in injury to the crown. A generalized recommendation of how you might be able to reach that goal of 60 to 80 pounds of nitrogen would be to apply 25 to 40 pounds of nitrogen in late February or mid-March when the plants start to grow. On a soil that's low in phosphorus and potassium, you could apply 2.5 to 4 pounds of 10, 10, 10 per 100 foot of row to reach that nitrogen recommendation and also put out some phosphorus and potassium. On a soil that's high in phosphorus and potassium, you could apply 1 to 2.5 pounds of ammonium nitrate per 100 foot of row. But again, we're really going to recommend that you rely on your soil testing and your plant tissue nutrient testing to determine your phosphorus and potassium needs for the crop. Subsequently, you can make your second application sometime in late April to May, again applying 25 to 40 pounds of nitrogen. And then you could finish up with a small application of 10 pounds of nitrogen per acre in late July or early August after harvest. So we're really trying to target one application to right when the plants are starting to grow. And then we want a second application just before fruiting and right when the primocanes are starting to develop. And then we might make one more fertilizer application after harvest to further encourage those primocanes to grow before they go dormant in the fall. The use of banded fertilizer applications only works if the grower is not using landscape fabric or plastic for weed control. But if growers are using landscape fabric for weed control, fertigation is going to be the preferred method and is generally seen as a more efficient method for applying nutrients. Fertigation is when fertilizer is dissolved and injected into the drip irrigation system so it's delivered directly to the roots. So you're able to sort of drip feed throughout the season and make a larger number of applications more easily. So a generalized recommendation of how you might be able to break up that 60 pounds of nitrogen that we're trying to shoot for uh, throughout the season would be to make application of around 15 pounds of nitrogen around March 1st. And then every 15 days after that through April 15th, apply another 10 pounds of nitrogen and then follow up with about five more pounds of nitrogen in early May. Again, we don't want to be applying too much fertilizer while the plants are actively fruiting and we're harvesting because that can lead to some issues with soft fruit. Um, so that's why we're, we're really cutting off that fertilizer application sometimes towards the early part of May. Uh, in doing so, you're going to apply around 50 pounds of nitrogen from the early part of the season to right before the plants start to fruit. Uh, and that leaves a remainder of 10 pounds that could be applied after harvest, again trying to encourage those primocanes to set a lot of good growth uh, in the fall after harvest has finished. Now the dates that I'm mentioning here are not set in stone and you should take into consideration your local climatic conditions and year-to-year -year variation in temperature. Really the reason why I'm mentioning these dates is just to kind of show you where in the season fertilizer should be applied. Now throughout this I've been talking about our goal of applying either 60 to 80 pounds of actual nitrogen. And it's important for growers to realize the difference between actual nitrogen and applied fertilizer. So if our goal is to apply 60 pounds of actual nitrogen, how much fertilizer of three different sources do we actually have to put out to get that goal? So for example, ammonium nitrate is 34% nitrogen. If we want to apply one pound of ammonium nitrate, that means we're only applying 0.34 of a pound of actual nitrogen. So if we have to put out 176 pounds of ammonium nitrate to get 60 pounds of actual nitrogen. For calcium nitrate, which has an analysis of 15.5% nitrogen, it has no phosphorus or potassium, so the next two numbers are 0, 0. It does have 19% calcium. Because it is a lower analysis, we are going to have to put out more fertilizer. So we're going to have to put out 387 pounds of calcium nitrate to get 60 pounds of actual nitrogen. And the potassium nitrate is an even lower analysis, only 13% nitrogen. 
So that means that we have to put out 461 pounds of potassium nitrate to get 60 pounds of actual nitrogen. So how do we do the math to figure this out? The easiest way to do it is to take your desired rate of nitrogen, which would be 60 pounds of nitrogen, and divide it by the percent nitrogen in a given fertilizer. So if, for example, we're talking about ammonium nitrate, that would be 0.34, because that's the percent of nitrogen in that fertilizer. That gives us 176 pounds of that fertilizer, 3400, that we must apply in order to achieve our rate of, of 60 pounds. Now these three fertilizer sources that I've listed here are very commonly used in horticultural production um, and then also in blackberries. Ammonium nitrate is a nice source again because it is high in nitrogen. Calcium nitrate and potassium nitrate are also nice sources because they are also supplying either calcium or some potassium. And calcium and potassium are both important nutrient sources for fruit crops. Calcium is really important for cell walls, so it can be important for firmness of fruit. And then potassium is a nutrient that many fruit crops have a high demand for during their fruiting period. Now one other advantage of calcium nitrate and potassium nitrate is that both of those fertilizers have a slight effect on raising the soil pH to a small degree. In the South, we struggle with acid soils. And so if a grower is having issues with a pH that is too low and they have not been able to adequately lime it prior to planting, calcium nitrate and potassium nitrate may be preferred sources of fertilizer as opposed to ammonium nitrate because ammonium-based fertilizers actually have the opposite effect where they slightly acidify the soil over time. Potassium nitrate is an expensive source of fertilizer, and it can be difficult to manage sometimes, particularly uh, in fertigation situations, because it can be slow to dissolve in water. But in a situation where a grower needs to put out potassium and nitrogen, potassium nitrate is a really great source. All right, let's move on and talk about trellising of blackberries. So why do we trellis blackberries? One of the big reasons is it keeps the fruit and the canes off the ground. Now you remember that blackberry canes, if they make contact with the ground, will actually start to root in um, and self-propagate themselves in that way. And so we really want to avoid that happening because it makes it very difficult to manage the crop effectively if there are canes rooting in outside of the row. Another reason that we're trying to keep the fruit and the canes off the ground is just because it eases picking and it eases the application of different fungicides or insecticides. We also want to keep them up off the ground because it's going to improve air circulation and air circulation can help reduce disease incidence. The final reason that we use trellising is to try and ease the management of the canes. So this picture on the right hand side shows really nicely how tying the four canes to the uh, trellising wires here, we're able to keep the four canes on the outside of the rows so it's easier to pick them. And then we're allowing space in the middle for the new primocanes to come up. When do you install the trellis system? It's generally important to get it installed before or soon after planting. Here again is our picture of a comparison between four-month-old plants and one-year-old plants. You can see that on the four-month-old plants, the trellising structure have been installed, but the wires have not been put up yet because the plants aren't really big enough to need it. The advantage of having the trellis system installed prior to planting is that there's less chance of damaging the young growing plants. So what are some of the major parts of a blackberry trellis? You will have end or anchor posts at both ends of each row. Those again just help anchor the overall trellising system. Then you also have your line posts that are there to help hold the different trellising wires up um, as you go down the row. End posts at the end of each row should be a larger diameter than the line posts. Um, we generally recommend that they're driven into the ground three feet if possible. On rocky ground that may be difficult. And we'd like to leave at least five feet of the posts above ground. So you want probably at least an eight foot post. Line posts based around four to six feet from the end post and then about 25 to 30 feet between each other. Uh, the, you're gonna have two trellising wires. The top wire is gonna be the wire that has the most weight on it. So it's going to be thicker gauge wire. Generally, we recommend about 12 and a half gauge. The bottom wire will have less weight on it. So you could go with uh, a 14 gauge wire on the bottom. Some options for what you use as your line posts can be either wood or metal. Generally, T posts are commonly used. It is important to realize that generally wood if it stands up to wind stress better. So if you're in a location that, where you anticipate having high winds, you may want to make your line posts out of wood. Other components of the trellising system will vary based on the specific design you choose. And I'm gonna talk about three different designs here in a second. 
One of the major designs that's commonly used to trellis blackberries is the V trellis. And this uses two line posts put in the ground at angles to make a V shape, as you can see in the diagram here. Again, rebar or fence post is generally used. This design does allow some flexibility because you are able to adjust the height of the wires along those line posts. The second design that I commonly see growers use is the T trellis. The T trellis uses fewer line posts so there is less cost there and instead uses crossbars to hold the top and bottom wires away from the posts. One disadvantage is, is that generally it's more difficult to adjust the height of the wires because your crossbars are stationary. There's also an option called the I trellis and this is basically a T trellis without those crossbars and the wires just rest directly on your line posts. This doesn't allow a lot of space for the canes and can it result in some reductions in yield, so we generally don't recommend it to growers. Both the T and the V trellising designs are trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to get the crop to grow in an inverted TP shape so that the floor canes are on the outside and then there's an open space again in the middle where the prima canes can come up. And both of these trellising systems, a general recommendation is that from the ground to the bottom wire, it's going to be anywhere from two to three feet. And then from that bottom wire to the top wire will be another two to three feet. A new trellising design that's starting to be adopted and evaluated to a greater degree in the south is the rotating crossarm trellis. The rotating crossarm trellis is interesting because it's not a static trellis. The trellising arms actually can rotate about 90 to 100 degrees from the 3 o'clock position to the 11 o'clock position. And the reason that this trellis was developed with this capability is to use the principle of phototrophism, which is just what causes plants to grow towards sunlight, in order to manipulate the crop. So in this picture here, you can see that the trellis arm is laid over. This is early spring, and you can start to see that the flowers are coming out on the plants. So by laying over all of the canes onto one side, and the plant is naturally going to grow towards the sun. So as the flowers emerge from the buds and start to develop, it will naturally come out only on that side that is facing the sun. After flowering commences, we can then rotate that arm up and over which will mean that because all the flowers came out on that side, all of the berries are also only going to be on that one side. This makes it a lot easier to pick because you only have to pick one side of the trellising system. There are only berries on one side. And here in the south, we're actually able to orient the trellis so that when you rotate the trellis up and over, all of those berries are actually on the north side so that they're shaded the entire day. This makes it easier on pickers because they're able to pick in the shade and then all the berries are shaded so that they don't get heated up the warm afternoon sun and that may lead to potentially less losses of fruit quality. Again, blackberries are sensitive to temperatures below zero degrees. So this system was originally developed so that uh, the canes could be laid down on the ground in the winter and a blanket could be put over or a row cover could be put over the canes to protect them so that blackberries could be grown in those more northern regions. For us in the south, this may provide other opportunities where in the spring, if we start to get some cold temperatures when the plants are flowering, we may be able to throw a row cover over the crop to try and protect those flowers from a sudden late spring frost. One of the concerns that I often get from growers uh, who are asking about this type of trellising system is the ability of the canes to move. Um, blackberry canes are quite woody. But part of the technique of using this system is training the canes when they're still green. And if that is done correctly, the canes can actually rotate quite easily. Now again, I said that one of the advantages of using a trellising system is the ability to separate the flora canes and the prima canes. And the rotating crossarm trellis also has this capability. The way that this is managed is by putting all of the flora canes on the long arm and then training the new emerging prima canes onto the short arm. Once we're done, harvest is over, we're able to remove all of those flora canes and then transfer the prima canes that were being trained on the short arm onto that long arm so that they will be ready to be flora canes in the following season. You can see a little bit more clearly how this is done on the right hand side. As a new cane emerges, it is actually trained along the bottom wire horizontally with the ground until it reaches the next plant. When it reaches the next plant, that prima cane is then tipped, uh, growing point is pinched off, and that releases again the laterals along the cane. Those laterals are then trained upward on the wires to fill in the whole trellising system.
Here you can see a planting in the early spring where the forecanes are on the long arm and then you can see these new emerging primocanes on the right hand side that will soon begin being trellised onto that short arm. I also like this picture because it shows you that we're trellising two or three primocanes in the lateral position across the bottom wire. In this picture you can see that that, that happened last year and they're now forecanes and that they're tied onto that bottom wire. The rotating cross arm trellis is a trellising system that we are evaluating here at the University of Arkansas and other universities also have research projects going on throughout the southeast. We recommend that you contact your local university extension program to see what their recommendations for the use of the rotating cross arm trellis are in your area. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.